As science continues to reveal that our emotions are far more than the hardwired reactions they were long believed to be, but actually a complex source of information, becoming more attuned to our feelings offers us a wealth of sources of growth. In this show, we talk to Tim Lomas, one of the world's leading researchers in positive psychology, about his work and his project to codify untranslatable words. This is a fascinating show that we hope unlocks some deep insights for our listeners. You're listening to The Evolving Leader. I'm Scott Allender, co-host of the show, along with my friend and colleague, John Gomes. How are you feeling today, John? Het say. What say? Het say. What does that mean? Well, we have a, uh, an amazing opportunity here to get this translated, but I think it means beyond excited. Ah. And we'll come back wow. to why, why, why I'm feeling that in a minute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> How are you feeling, Scott? Uh, well, I'm feeling a little het say myself because, uh, you know, wrapping up a, a really good week, heading into a long weekend here in the States. And as you are, I'm incredibly excited to be speaking with our guest today because today we are joined by Dr. Tim Lomas. Tim is a lecturer in positive psychology at the University of East London. He is the author of numerous papers and books related to positive psychology, gender, mindfulness, and Buddhism. And his current area of research involves creating a lexicography of untranslatable words related to well-being. On his website, his work is described as driving the field forward into new uncharted territory. Oh, and as well as having taught English in China and being a psychiatric nursing assistant at one point, he was also a singer in a ska band. So we might have to ask him to sing a little for us today as well. So... Dr. Lomas, we are truly delighted that you are here. Welcome to The Evolving Leader. Oh, wow. Thanks for having me. Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's a real real pleasure. Um, so, um, Tim, can we start by how you became interested in cross-cultural perspectives on well-being? What led you here? And in this, it might be useful to help our listeners make distinction in your work between positive psychology and positive thinking, which amongst the general public might be a little bit conflated or confused. Sure. So I never know quite how much to say. I don't want to give my whole biography, but I guess, you know, a salient point to mention is when I was 19, I went to China to teach English for six months, which was, you know, an amazing experience, really kind of broke down my horizons all kind of ways, um, emotionally, intellectually, physically, obviously. Um, I was such a, you know, quite naive and then just kind of thrown over there and then kind of landed on my feet and just had an amazing time. And it's just included traveling around and visiting Taoist and Buddhist monasteries. Um, and I had so many incredible experiences that really took me outside of myself and outside my well comfort zone, my horizons understanding, the frameworks with which I used to understand the world. You know, you're encountering concepts like Nirvana um, in the context of Buddhism. I know that's a, a Sanskrit term, but um, so concepts that I had no framework for understanding, you know, even now, like <laughs> over 20 years on, I still don't really. It's one of those, you know, it's, it eludes my, my grasp even now. And then, but especially then I had this real sense there was so much in the world that I was unfamiliar with, you know, growing up in, in London, like London's, you know, it's interesting and exciting and it's, it's very multicultural. It's full of great people and great ideas, but even so I had my, you know, the bubble I was brought up in, let's say, and then going to China really just took me radically outside that. And then I think just opened my mind to the possibilities of how much there is in the world in, in, in every sense, you know, uh, including intellectually, conceptually, metaphysically and, and everything. Um, so that you know, really struck me and made me aware of how limited my own understanding was at the time. And then I, I took that back with me because I went back to the UK to study psychology at Edinburgh, which I loved. It was a great course, you know, full of great teachers and um, experiences. But, you know, even so, I had the sense that the psychology that I was encountering, it was still pretty limited, you know, not least because it overlooked almost anything I had encountered over in China with some interesting exceptions. You know, it was the early days of um, research into mindfulness. So that was kind of creeping into psychology, which was just a kind of limited glimpse into this, these other potentialities. But then from the limited understanding I had of Buddhism at the time, I knew that Buddhism was full 
of intricate theories of the mind and well-being and you know these were nowhere in the psychology that at least that I was studying or encountering so I had this sense that the field like I say as I was encountering it was pretty like limited and incomplete it's not to say it was wrong or flawed or it was just partial it, it was missing out on a lot so you know that sense really stayed with me then like I took a bit of a detour I don't know if we'll get into this but I I spent like six or seven years trying to be a musician <laughs> um which as I'm sure you both know it's tricky to make as a career but it was great fun but I you know I did that and I was doing the nursing as well to make some money but then in my 20s my, my late 20s I got the chance to do a PhD down in London looking at the impact of meditation on mental health so this kind of brought me back into consideration of like cross-cultural issues because partly it was looking at meditation but also the broader context in which people practice meditation so I was specifically looking at male meditators in London but then also the kind of meditation and Buddhist communities they were part of and the ideas they got from those communities which would include concepts from Buddhism like Nirvana or like Karma or like Metta which is loving kindness so these people engaging with all these ideas that originated from outside the UK let's say and you know not expressed in English and then that kind of took me back into this consideration really of cross-cultural perspectives. I finished that in 2012 and I got this I got a job as a lecturer at the University of East London in 2013 and then so from there I tried to the research I did I tried to engage with cross-cultural perspectives. So it'd be good to just get a definition of, of um, positive psychology as well and and how that plays out into this work. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, in a nutshell, really, it's the scientific study of well-being. But, you know, even as I say that, that's um, a problematic definition because other areas also look at well-being. So one way to look at the role of positive psychology is to think about different forms of well-being. So you could think about there's physical well-being, mental well-being, social well-being, even spiritual well-being. You know, And then you can imagine each of those forms of well-being as being on a spectrum you know, between a kind of negative territory through into positive territory. I mean, this spectrum metaphor is flawed because each of those dimensions themselves has many dimensions and people can be situated on different places on all of those internal dimensions, but it's a useful heuristic. So you could think about these four dimensions and then you take the physical dimension of well-being, the negative territory, you know, that's really the province of fields like, you know, well, medicine broadly, you know, helping to cure or ameliorate illness and then even trying to bring people into the more positive territory so even if some ostensible absence of you know illness or disorder how can they you know flourish physically you know thinking about you know, exercise nutrition and so on so then when you get into the the spectrum of you know, mental well-being in the negative territory you have fields like psychiatry and psychotherapy you know and their goal really is to help cure or ameliorate forms of mental disorder, you know, bring people up to this notional zero at the midpoint, which, you know, it's that's usually valuable, obviously. But then, you know, people have made the case, you know, even if someone was somewhat free of mental disorder or dysfunction, like, are they fully flourishing? You know, are they, do they have real deep meaning in life? Do they experience joy, you know, flourishing and fulfilling relationships and so on? So positive psychology is really exploring this the positive territory of the mental well-being spectrum, if you like. Not only positive psychology, because you've got fields like humanistic psychology dating back to the, well, really the 30s, in fact, that have charted that territory. But, you know, humanistic psychology was much more about therapeutic practice, whereas positive psychology, you know, really emphasised scientific study of well-being. I mean, humanistic psychology had its scientific elements too, obviously, but with positive psychology, it really kind of emphasised that scientific basis so that's that's kind of where it's situated so it's looking at well-being but in that particular way in that particular form of well-being I would say oh you mentioned like does that differ from positive thinking which is a good question yeah well you know it's super interesting with the terms positive and negative because you can use positive and negative in different ways you know so something could be positively or negatively valenced you know does it mm. feel pleasant or unpleasant but it could be positive or negative in terms of utility or outcome you know does it benefit well-being or not and or positive or negative, you know, morally, does it conform or align with one's kind of ethical frameworks and so on? So when we talk about positive thinking, you know, you can think about that in various ways. So a thought could be positive in tone, in its emotional tone, but then the field of positive psychology is really much broader than that because 
you can get into interesting territory where a thought or an emotion or really any subjective phenomena might be, for example, negatively valenced, but still relevant or conducive to well-being in some sense. So just because something might have a negative valence, might feel unpleasant, it doesn't mean it's not relevant or useful to one's well-being in some sense. Yeah. So, so, so some some negative emotions might, for example, be very healthy. You might feel yeah, sorrow like, or anger or something. It might be healthy. They feel negative, but they they, they're not actually negative, right? Yeah. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, like they can have their place. I mean, obviously, you'll get problematic forms, and that'll then you're in the territory of like disorder, and that needs people need help for that. But more, you know. Other forms could be considered, you know, adaptive even. And even if not adaptive, just part of the human condition. And, you know, we're not wrong or flawed for having those feelings and as such. So I would say positive psychology, yeah, it's it's a broader scope than simply thoughts or feelings that might be considered like positively valenced. So if I hear you correctly, it's becoming really aware of this vast emotional experience and understanding what steps need to be taken um, based on what those feelings might be telling you. Do I have that somewhat right when I hear what I'm hearing? Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely part of it because, you know, one way that people like to look at emotions is as forms of information, you know. So in mm -hmm. that context, an emotion could be negatively valenced, but it still has useful information that you could act on. You know, a sense of fear in response to a genuine threat would make you going to get away from that threat or take action to address it. So that's like a useful, necessary emotion in a sense. So you can think about emotions as information that you can act upon. That's definitely important, an important part of the field because my colleagues and I have tried to capture these, these nuances by the phrase second wave positive psychology, because I think, you know, when the field initially emerged, it was focused more on, I suppose, positively balanced emotions and experiences. All these seeming paradoxes and nuances had to remain more implicit at the start because I think you know, the founders were well aware of it so like Martin Seligman who founded the field like back in 1990s he was warning about bewaring of like needing to use the pessimism's keen sense of reality at times you know so these ideas were there but only implicit um, mm -hmm. but then once the field like found its foundation become established then people started to make these more explicit and bring these seeming paradoxes out so to look at the way in which an emotion or a thought could be negatively valenced, but still useful to one's well-being. So we, anyway, we called this, I guess, somewhat contentiously, the second wave of the field. I think it's contentious because some people thought it was as if superseding the first wave, which is definitely not what we meant. It was more just, you know, having laid that foundation and we can get into the nuances and then that kind of critique, that problematizing of positive and negative could be considered like a second wave. So... In season one of the podcast, um, neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett joined us to talk about her theory of constructed emotions. Um, her theory being that emotions are not hardwired like in the in the popular children's movie Inside Out, but instead something that we create using concepts, um, in other words, language to make sense of our predictions and what our physical body is experiencing or our body budget. So your positive uh, lexicography research uh, project of well-being words that don't universally translate seems to be backing up Lisa's premise. Can you tell us how you came to focus on this and what this work is revealing? Oh, sure. So with the lexicography, you know, I guess the seeds really were planted back in my trip to China, you know, when I was encountering these words like the Tao or Nirvana, becoming acutely aware that I didn't have an English equivalent. And then no translation or description was really adequate. You know, you could read a whole book on Nirvana, obviously, and not get it, or the Tao. So this this idea that it, they were really eluding my understanding, and I didn't have this terminology at the time. But, you know, looking back, these are like almost like archetypal, untranslatable words. They don't have an exact equivalent or even near equivalent in English. So the way the project started was, you know, those seeds were planted, and then I think um, encountering other such words in my PhD study with the male meditators, the meditators I was interviewing, talking about words like karma or you know, meta, which is loving kindness, you know, and it seemed significant also that they would use these words in their original Sanskrit. They wouldn't try and render them in English. So again, alluding to the fact that there wasn't this easy translation, easy equivalent in English, hence them using the terms in their original language. But then the real, the project really got kickstarted in 2015 because I was at this positive psychology conference 
in Florida in this strange hotel. Anyway, what, just wandering around slightly aimlessly, and then I stumbled across this talk by a Finnish researcher, Amelia Lati, on uh, a Finnish concept called Sisu, which she described as this kind of form of you know, extraordinary courage and determination, especially in the face of adversity. Um, obviously, there's overlaps there with concepts like um, resilience and grit and so on. But, you know, her point was they're not synonymous, they're not identical, there's an overlap, but they're not the same. And there's value in looking at this concept, which she would present as really integral to Finnish identity and culture and how they see themselves, but also, crucially, not only to Finnish people. She, she would suggest that it's a really interesting concept that has more universal applicability and hasn't been studied really in psychology. It's not on the table for, for the main reason that you can make the case that psychology, like other fields, is very Western centric. And then like a perfect illustration of that is the fact that its default language really is English, right? So in, in journals and international conferences, English is the, the lingua franca, if I'm gonna use a non-English word, but you know what I mean? It's the common language, which means that it's the default and then if there are concepts that aren't expressed or don't exist in English, these tend to get overlooked. Like there's obviously exceptions because you know, psychology has a rich tradition of drawing on words and adopting words from other languages, like German, for example, with Gestalt and Ganzheit, you know, so it definitely takes words from other languages, but obviously there's so many other words out there that haven't been similarly adopted or borrowed or brought in in some way. So Sisu could be considered one of them. So she was making the case that, you know, we should add this to our conceptual framework. This should be on the table in terms of the concepts that we look at as a field. And, you know, something about that talk just really, I guess, set off a chain of thinking in my head and really sparked a lot of ideas. And then, you know, I actually, I got home to London after the conference and went to visit my mum and was chatting around the dinner table. And I just, she said, how was the conference? And I said, well, it was great. And, and I mentioned this talk and my mum speaks a, a bunch of languages, like including French and German. And then the conversation turned to other words that we don't have in English. And at the time, I wouldn't have this terminology of untranslatable because, you know, I'm not a linguist. That's not my background. I'm, you know, I'm in psychology. But, you know, we had this conversation around, well, what words did she know in German and French that we don't have in English? And then kind of by the end of the conversation, I thought it'd be really interesting and valuable to just collect as many as I can from across all languages, you know, as a way of, you know, enriching the conceptual frameworks in psychology, as a way of engaging with and ex appreciating other cultures as well as getting outside our own western centric bubble just to, and just as an interesting exercise myself a way to connect with people around the world you know because I knew that I would really love this to be some kind of crowd sourced or collaborative project not just me toiling away on my own on my own you know so I was hoping that people would get in touch and suggest words and so on but like obviously like no one knew who I was or what I was doing. So I, you know, I needed to get the ball rolling. So I published a paper. I did an initial analysis of a couple hundred words and then published that. And then that, that was really fortunate to get some media attention. Like there was this lovely article in the New Yorker, which was like obviously such a boost. Amelia Anthes, thanks to her, you know, that was that was great. And then in the meantime, I'd been creating this like homemade website where I put the the project as it were. And then as I'd hoped for people getting in touch, you know, suggesting words and um also, also helped me refine my definitions. Like I always try to present this as a work in progress because it's it's always incomplete, provisional. Everything can always mm -hmm. be improved and updated. So in that spirit, people would, because I'm aware of the irony of trying to present untranslatable words and then like translate them or describe them. So for all the words, I have like a relatively brief definition, always bearing in mind that you could write like a whole paper or a whole book on a given word. So this obviously doesn't exhaust their meanings, but just to give a, a bit of a sense of what their meanings are. And then people would say, well, either you know, you could amend that or you could add to that. So it's been really helpful, people getting in touch, and it's kind of evolved from there, really. Well, that's where that's where I got the uh, the head say at the beginning of the show, um, <laughs> the Vietn Vietnamese uh, word for beyond excited. Um, just pulling together a couple of things that you've said here. One one is the um, the fact that. There's an increasing acceptance that emotions are not just this messy noise, but they're actually data. They're telling you something profound about what's going on. Mm. And and there's a vast spectrum. It's not just this kind of um, binary, it's 
fear or it's love or it's you know it's positive or negative. It's a vast complexity around that. And then the other part of it, which I think is really fascinating, is is Lisa Lisa's constructed theory of emotions, which points to the idea that cultures have unique emotions. In fact, families probably ha- even have unique emotions. You know, it's mm. very very specific. The language we give to them might be inaccurate sometimes, but we we do experience things very uh, specifically. Um, so as you pull those two things together, it feels like there's just a world of possibility that you're opening up there in terms of, yeah. you know, helping people to empathize and make sense of um, other yeah. cultures, other people, um, which yeah. is, you know, is a massively positive thing. And I know you're doing some incredible work in that area. But the other, the other piece for me, which I just wanted to dig into for a second, is that in most of the words that you're talking about, especially the ones that are most interesting, they're not one emotion. They're almost like a composite. Like I know you didn't put Schadenfreude in your your lexicon because that's not a, not a, a, a positive thing, but it speaks to something that is a, a, a mixture of often competing emotions that resolve in yeah. you know. So we don't we don't ever feel one thing, do we? We don't ever have one emotion predominantly. We are always kind of a mixture of things. Making sense of that is really interesting. I, I think. I think it's fair to say that, you know, some people might make the case that it's obviously there's complex debates, but, you know, with respect to all of this. So some people might say you can't experience two conflicting emotions simultaneously, but others would disagree and say that you can. I would just say, I think a whole phenomenological ter- terrain is so complex and detailed. It's such a one metaphor I like to try and use with respect to like language is you know, a navigational metaphor around cartography, around mapping our inner world. So I think, you know, one function of language is to map our worlds, like the world around us and also our our inner world of thoughts and feelings and sensations and so on. And then a model I've found helpful in terms of what these worlds are like. Um, There's a theorist, I think, Jürgen Fell, has a model called a state-space approach where our inner world and also our external world could be seen as a state space of any number of dimensions so it's not just two dimensions you know let's say valence and arousal but there's many other dimensions potentially meaning and um, intensity and duration and so on you could imagine this really complex internal space that's n-dimensional not just two or three but n dimensions and then in that context i think language serves to delineate regions of this inner space by drawing boundaries around around these regions you know and then here's where you get into theories like social constructionism this idea that these the boundaries imposed are somewhat arbitrary you know so you can look at the way real geographical map of the world you take the complexity of the world and you draw boundaries around certain regions to create countries and regions and you know, that's somewhat arbitrary, not entirely, because there's obviously natural phenomena like seas and rivers that can divide regions, but the imposition of boundaries could be considered somewhat arbitrary. So then here's where that also links with theories around culture, because there's a whole other tradition of theories called, often referred to as a linguistic relativity hypothesis, or the, sometimes the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which suggests that, you know, you know, language, at least to some extent, influences how we perceive and experience and understand the world. So you can look at the way the way in which those boundaries are drawn can differ from culture to culture. And then in having these differing boundaries, it can shape people's perceptions and understanding of the world, sometimes in big ways and sometimes in more fine grain ways. I mean, even that's just such a, a crude simplification, because, you know, when you think about theories of structuralism and post-structuralism in language, it's not just simply that regions are circumscribed by boundary but concepts also get their meaning from how they're connected to other concepts so the whole network of of structure you know so any given term it might carve out a particular region of experience let's say but then it takes on all these other layers by the way it's connected to particular traditions or events in a country you know so you can imagine how any given feeling could take on all kinds of layers of significance, undertones and overtones based on how it's been used in that country and people's like experiential familiarity with it. So for example, you know, 
growing up in Britain, I experienced Christmas, let's say, you know, and then, but that experience and that's denoted by the word Christmas, that's layered with all my experiences of having had Christmases and all my like, treasured memories and whatever happened on those Christmas days, you know, the same way in which someone could understand nominally what Christmas is, but they wouldn't have those layers of experience. And the same would imply to kind of phenomena that are particular to other cultures. So this is, to, to say the least, it's like a complex scene, but our emotional world, I think, is almost like infinitely nuanced and complex. And then there's much to be gained, I think, from having a more precise understanding of that world. So um, Lisa talks about emotional differentiation or granularity, this idea that there's lots to be gained from having a more fine grained understanding of this world. It helps people in terms of their, their own well-being, being able to navigate their world. So to use that kind of cartographic metaphor, because we're immersed in these worlds anyway. So someone could lack granularity or differentiation and then just be caught up in this inner maelstrom or whirlwind as such, you know, and not really, sometimes not even aware of what they're feeling in a real kind of reflective way. But there's much to be gained then from trying to gain awareness, including by differentiating, differentiating different experiences and concepts and so on. So as you can see, I'm trying to give a sense of there's so many different, not just theories, but like theoretical realms that sort of intersect here. So there's different ways into this whole phenomenon, but yeah, I th I'm going to just explore these intersections and I think it's just a really rich terrain, you know? Yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear, you've mentioned a few of them already, but I would love to hear some of your favorite words that have unlocked some of this emotional granularity in you. What's helped you become more connected and aware of the vastness of your emotional experience? Oh yeah, that's a good question. I suppose, well, I do have this long-standing interest in you know, Buddhism and meditation. So mm -hmm. that's one that's one area where almost any book you read is going to be full of these kinds of terms. And each each of these words is almost a window onto a new world. I'll, I'll caveat that. When I look at these words generally, I think that some of them fall into two categories in a sense. One, they name something I'm already familiar with. I already know it. I just didn't have a word for it. So sometimes you, you hear a word, you think, that's great. I know that feeling. Amazing. And it's, and this is how languages evolve. You know, we lack words for phenomena, but we notice that other languages have them and then we might borrow them and use them, which is just very useful. People find that useful and that happens in languages all the time. But then there's another class of words that they seem to signify something. I have no idea what they're representing. I haven't had that experience. So for the, they're more like windows or portals onto like a new landscape that I've not visited, but I get a little glimpse through this portal. So for me, lots of words in Buddhism, you know, I like that. Um, so some of them fall into the first class. So I mentioned metta. So this can often translate as loving kindness. And the meditators I interviewed for my PhD, you know, they, they would talk about this as an important quality that they would also try and cultivate themselves. So there's a practice called the metta bhavana, which is loving kindness meditation. So, you know, they were somewhat familiar with this idea. It's, but then they would engage in practices to try and cultivate. So there's words like that, which have really resonated. So I, I'll try that practice myself. I'm not very good at meditating, but you know, I, I try to cultivate that in myself. And then there's others that then fall into that second class, which are, I guess, more esoteric or they hadn't, I didn't have that experiential familiarity with them, but then I've been trying to engage with them and what they signify. So there's several, for example, connected with, Zen Buddhism, Japanese terms, wabi sabi is one that people might be familiar with. It describes a kind of like weathered, aged beauty. So, you know, when we think about aesthetics and beauty, from one perspective, perhaps in a Western culture, we might be drawn to things that are symmetrical and new and shiny and, and so on. But there's other concepts that speak to different forms of beauty. So, like the way in which an old, weathered, aged tree or a ruined castle can be beautiful in a deep, profound sense. And it's to do partly with the ephemeral nature of identity and the way things change um, over time and our own sense of, you know, limited time on earth. And there's all these kind of rich sensibilities involved within a concept such as Wabi Sabi. It's not that we don't have those sensibilities necessarily in English and in, let's say, Western aesthetics, but, you know, it's really been highlighted 
in Zen Buddhism and Japanese more generally. So that's a really interesting concept to reflect on and it links to other ones. So for example, there's a term called Kintsugi, which is, it's a really a philosophy and a practice of repairing broken crockery using gold lacquer. So such that when you repair things, you're not trying to hide the flaws, but mm -hmm. almost accentuate them in such a way that the character of an object is almost to do with those flaws. You know, and that brings to mind, like, I always think of that Leonard Cohen line, you know, the cracks where the light gets in, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, it's, it's, and then obviously you can make the link and analogy to people and it's people's flaws are what gives them their character in a sense. And, you know, you can almost, not that we have to welcome our flaws, but there's certainly something to be said about they make us who we are and we should at least, you know, appreciate people or at oneself for that. So, you know, a term like Wabi Sabi or Kintsugi, just to I reflect on that for a while. It's yeah. cool, isn't it? Yeah, it can just yeah. lead you down some interesting thought, you know, interesting directions. The idea that the thing becomes even more beautiful when the, when the gold sort of fills in is just such a beautiful right. idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? And just so just mm -hmm. that one term, and then if you can sit and reflect on that for even 10 minutes, then, mm -hmm. you know, it can lead you down some unexpected pathways and just open up new new ideas or, you know, help you reevaluate what it means for something to be beautiful or valued or treasured. Yeah, and I'd really recommend people go onto your website and, and look at the uh, the lexicon because I found just reading through it, I spent half an hour the other day just in a break reading through it and just kind of familiarizing myself with a few of the words. And, of course, uh, I'm not a linguist, so I, I won't be able to pronounce these, but I found the, the kind of composition of some of those uh, descriptions, like the Czech word uh, Krausemuten to describe beautiful sadness, and we mirrored the Dutch word depicting strength to overcome a feeling of sorrow. They're all kind of incredibly evocative. And in your distinction between kind of old friends and mysterious strangers, oh, I, was trying to put, I was trying to put them into the category. Is that, isn't that an old friend that I haven't really <laughs> put a language around or is that a mysterious stranger? And the mysterious strangers are the ones that I found the most kind of profoundly valuable. Um, mm. So I, I'd recommend you know, our listeners oh. go on to your your uh, site to look at that oh thanks very much yeah no, so not you mean because i like that that terminology the old friends that's the kind of the words they give voice to experiences i'm already familiar with i think you know and i've had them in some extent but then the mysterious strangers they're the kind of portals onto new worlds and you know there's just i guess so many journeys of discovering uh, discovery awaiting people you know for example like again to go back to buddhism you could read a book on meditative states because you know there's such rich traditions of meditative practice in kind of different Eastern cultures. And then accordingly, they develop such granular lexicon of these different experiential states. So like, you know, you have Nirvana, but many, many others. And then, so to read a book is to just in, on Buddhism is to encounter a list of these. And it's on, you know, an analogy is like looking at reading the description of the world and these places you've never heard of, let alone never been to. And then, it, but it tempts you to want to try and get there. And then some of these books so early do this kind of meditation practice. You might get a glimpse of this experiential state. So, it, you know, really opens my horizons to what, what's possible as a human being. Because like I say, you know, going back to when I was that teenager in China, you grew up with a set of concepts that you used to navigate the world, but also those concepts to some extent provide the limits, like your horizon of the world. But then you can realize there's so much that lay beyond, that lies beyond your horizons. And that's just a really tantalizing and exciting possibility. And then you can think, to use the navigational metaphor, you, you want to try and travel there or get there, or at least, or at least like speak with someone who's been there, or you know what I mean? So it just mm. get outside your own bubble, I think. Hi folks, producer Phil here. If you're enjoying the Evolving Leader and would like to stay connected with us between episodes, follow us on Twitter at evolving underscore leader. And please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate your support. Thanks for listening. That point you were making earlier on about, you know, if, if you don't have the language to describe what you're feeling, then, you know, you're experiencing this huge amount of data that you can't make sense of, which can make you feel like you're in a bit of a storm. Um, yeah. One of, the, one of the things that, that we've done over the years is, I mean, literally with thousands of people, ask them to describe how they're feeling. And their first cut of it typically resolves the first kind of, insight which is 
uh, you know, they say the same thing, you know, like most people that we talk to and ask this question say the same thing, which is they respond as if it's a pleasantry. So they'll say, I'm feeling fine or I'm feeling great or I'm feeling tired or I'm feeling busy. You know, they're not actually describing what they're feeling. They're just saying the mm. first thing that comes into their word because it's an automated response. But then yeah. when you do ask them, well, so just tell us a bit more about how you're actually feeling. And they don't have very many words at all to describe yeah. it. They don't actually know how they're feeling. But when they do, they kind of go, I don't really know. Yeah, I, yeah, I, feel, I feel okay. You know, it's it's kind of really cut off to them. And I'm, I'm just interested in your work um or your experiences of you know how, how how much do you think we really encourage people to ask that question of themselves in terms of how they're really feeling i would say not much not enough i i guess for various reasons you know i, I mean to begin with having this kind of introspect introspective insight even just introspection generally is is difficult you know so the meditation is a system for you know for this kind of deliberate introspection, but meditation is really difficult and people can get distracted and find it hard. Certainly I do. So it's, it's a difficult process, I think, to, to reflect and be aware of one's feelings. So that in itself is tricky. And that's a, that's a whole journey, you know, and then you encounter the problem that you know, language is so crude anyway, because, you know, we can do our best with words and then having a more detailed lexicon is helpful because then we can get even closer. But, you know, to be honest, I still think all experience is fundamentally ineffable. Like language doesn't capture them at all. All it does is it provides a label that if someone else has had a similar experience, they'll get what you mean. Mm. Like, for example, like if you've never tasted coffee, I couldn't describe it to you. I could use terms that you might have some reference points for. I'll say well, it's hot and it's a bit bitter and it can be sweet. And But like, obviously, you know, that's if you haven't tasted coffee, it doesn't mean anything really. So in some senses, I do think all experiences are ineffable. They often say mystical experiences are ineffable, but like pretty much everything is. But, you know, nevertheless, if you've had that familiarity, then words can get you closer. And that's where the granularity is helpful, because, again, to use this cartographic metaphor, you can take a word that can just, you know, enfold or encompass just a whole swathe of feelings. Like a really interesting example is love in English. It just, you know, encompasses so many types of experiences and feelings and relationships. So in one sense, that's like, that's okay. It's useful. It's still useful. It's not that it's not useful, but it'd be like having a, like a map of England that just had no internal lines. It was just England. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? But then you can obviously have a much more granular understanding, think about different forms of love. That's one, one of the topics in my project, you know, looking at different forms of love. And then you start to, carve out the contours, the internal contours of what love might mean. And then that can be helpful because then, you know, let's say two people, they have a relationship, right? And you call it love, but then, well, what kind of love is it? And then you can get into these interesting discussions around the internal complexities of what these emotions are. And I do think, like I say, language being crude and ineffective as it is, it's still useful in terms of us getting a better handle on what we're experiencing, you know? And, you know, you, you, see, you see this, for example, in school, you know, teaching kids to, you know, to use language to express what they're feeling. And, you know, they found that this is helpful. And this kind of skill set, this kind of capacity, it's not just a fixed trait. You know, really, people can really learn to develop it. That's the whole point of these. Well, that's the whole point of education, in a sense. People develop more granular language for any given topic. But so with kids, an emotion, for example, you can say, well, so you're feeling negative. But is it anxiety or frustration or anger? And you can help them pinpoint it with a bit more accuracy and then that they found that the kids can really learn to develop this vocabulary as kids do that's what you know that's what childhood's about in a sense partly is developing one's vocabulary not just with emotions but with everything so you can see how people could be helped or assisted in getting a more granular vocabulary and then you know just helps it again with the cartographic thing your your map is going to be more accurate and you can navigate things more more precisely with a bit you know a bit more ease and affect in your research have you noticed that certain uh, countries cultures have greater uh, granularity in language around emotion than others yeah that's such an interesting question because i mean on the one hand i tend to av avoid generalizations about particular cultures because you might think well what does your project say about country x or y and I tend to resist that for a couple of reasons, partly because my project is pretty incomplete and partial, you know, so 
I've not done systematic exploration of any given language or country. So I, I couldn't use it to make these generalizations. But also I don't like generalizations generally because I think any given region is so heterogeneous and complex and dynamic. You know, even the crude East v. West comparisons, you know, they just hide so much internal you know, complexity and so on. But like that said, you can obviously see that different cultures have developed certain vocabularies, you know, I don't want to keep talking about meditation, but again, with the Eastern cultures and languages, they do have so many rich traditions of meditation and then a really detailed language in relation to that, that we just don't really have in English. I mean, we do have comparable practices, you know, there's contemplative prayer, which is arguably in a similar territory, and there's a rich language in relation to that. So I find it hard to say, compare different cultures with respect to say emotions but it's perhaps slightly easier with respect to like cultural practices because mm -hmm. then you can tie them slightly more concretely to where a culture is situated for example and what its traditions are mm -hmm. so you can imagine that one observation like I said this is just a tentative one I've not done this systematic exploration but you could imagine the case that cultures in colder climates are going to have a much richer vocabulary related to kind of staying warm and cozy, <laughs> right? Compared to hot countries. And then I do find a whole bunch of words relating to forms of, let's say, coziness or homeliness, like huga, you might, you know, I guess lots of people know that now. Um, that be what might be one example. And then I would speculate you don't have that same granularity in countries where the weather's more, you know, in more temperate climates because it's just not necessary in a sense whereas those cultures might have a much richer language relating to the environmental conditions in which they find themselves or you know a seafaring culture will have lots of words relating to engaging with the sea let's say whereas a, a land-bound one it'd be more about the land so i do think particularly with regard to behaviors and practices perhaps you could perhaps tie that more concretely to where cultures are and what they kind of their contexts are. And then I guess that does link to emotions because there are emotions linked to these practices and experiences. So I would say you could probably can, but just that I haven't so I haven't yeah. so far, but I, I would like to try because it is super it's super interesting as a way of appreciating the uniqueness of a culture. Because I'm trying to keep these two perspectives in mind as I talk about this and do do everything. So like on the on the one hand there's a perspective of universalism like a common human nature, like people are all the same fundamentally. Then there's a, the counter perspective, of like pluralism or relativism, that people are fundamentally different place to place, you know, and then the differences are more interesting than similarities. And then you can find different people will emphasize one perspective or the other. And I think there's great value in both. And I essentially try to keep both in mind. Mm. Like that's certainly how I feel like, that there really is a common human nature and I can meet someone from a completely different culture. And then we're both human beings. And I know to some extent, perhaps what their experiences and emotions might be, but at the same time can also really respect and appreciate and cherish the differences because they have their unique culture, you know, and then I try to keep both. I'm, I'm trying to keep a sense of both in mind. I'm not sure how successfully, but I want to try and bring them together. I, there's a philosopher I love called Ken Wilber. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with him. And he's, I, I must have got this idea from him or anyway, been influenced by him. And he talks about universal pluralism, which sounds like a contradiction, but isn't. It's just the sense that at the same time, people have this common human nature, but also they distinct differences. And then something is lost if you lose either perspective. Because if you just focus on the differences, you lose sight of what brings us together, what unites us as human beings. But if you only focus on the similarities, you lose sense of cultural diversity and richness and what makes people unique and different. So I guess with all this, I'm not sure I went on that tangent, but I, I'm, try, mm. I'm trying to keep both of those in mind. So when I think about do cultures have a particular set of words for certain experiences, I don't think I would ever say that cultures have unique experiences. They might do actually, that's just a conjecture, but I, I do tend to think as human beings, we can experience similar phenomena, but at the same time, cultures have charted particular areas of experience with much more detail um and so there is that uniqueness and that diversity and plurality and difference so many anyway, trying to keep both in mind as far as i can from your point of view for our listeners what do you think the biggest leadership opportunity is 
from from all that we've been discussing? What, what's the call to action for for a leader? Well, you know, I guess there's so much. There's such a welcome focus now on like diversity and inclusion, and I, th- mm-hmm. well, in all contexts, but you know, in the workplace, and just you know, I would imagine if you're a leader and you have a a workforce, they'll be diverse, and there's so much to be gained from that diversity in all respects. I mean simply about representation itself but then also the ideas and practices that are to be found in the workplace so i guess it would be about trying to give people opportunities to you know show and celebrate and share their diversity in all respects you know their practices and ideas and behaviors and um, and ethics and so on so really giving that but i guess people are that's that's part of what this whole movement is about but really embracing that perspective and then also in that context, but also still not losing sight of the universalism I just mentioned as well, because I, I think that that's important too, if you can keep that as a as a common thread for everyone. So to recognize that we do will have, I think, these affinities and these commonalities, but at the same time, allowing that space for diversity to really shine forth and then and really embrace it, you know, for its own sake, but also for what it, you know, I guess if you're a leader of an organization, for what it do for your organization, you know, you're you might encounter ideas and practices that could transform your organizations in ways that you hadn't even thought of, I guess. So I guess really being open to those potentials. So as we come to the um, the end of our time, what, what's next for you? Because you, you're now in the US, um, an interesting time. <laughs> You've made, yeah. the, made the leap over to Seattle. What, what's next for you? So I've been involved for the last couple of years with this initiative called the Global Wellbeing Initiative which is it's fantastic is this partnership between Gallup, the polling organization, and Wellbeing for Planet Earth, which is a Japanese-based um, research and policy foundation. So the project is focused on developing new items for the Gallup World Poll that reflect non-Western perspectives on well-being. You know, Gallup has done a great job of assessing well-being globally since 2005. But you can make the case that the metrics they do could be considered Western centric. You know, it's it's life valuation and, and high arousal positive affect. Um, it's not that they only matter or are relevant to Western people. You know, they people the world over do answer the poll and hmm. it makes sense to them. But at the same time, you can make the case perhaps these metrics don't represent all there is in terms of what you want to know about well-being. Um, so we're trying to augment those items with ones from um, other cultural perspectives. So we've begun given the kind of where the foundation is with Eastern perspectives, looking at um, topics such as balance and harmony and uh, relationship to the to the group, relationship to nature, peace and calmness, vitality, mindfulness. So a, a bunch of interesting topics that we've included in the World Poll from 2020. So we're getting results from that now and then. But it's an evolving project. So we're trying to, that you know, begun by looking at Eastern cultures, but we'd like to really... St- look at all different kinds of world cultures obviously there's so many regions to consider and then try to bring them into the fold of what we think about when we talk about well-being and how we understand and measure it so that's a that's a really exciting project so we see where you know see where that goes and where we can take that and you know more broadly when we're thinking about studying conceptualizing well-being how can we just develop theories and the concepts we have in all kinds of ways, but particularly, I guess, in terms of moving outside the, the Western centricity, the field could be considered as having at the moment and then seeing where that takes us. And then you know, there's all kinds of interesting collaborations and conversations to be had in that in that sense, which we're, which we're trying to foster and cultivate now. So that's I guess that's the main focus. And then we'll see. I, you know, I tend to be open just to new ideas and possibilities. I don't know if this is a bit of a tangent, but I was just thinking the other day, I like Maybe this is too much of a tangent because we're getting towards the end. But I like thinking about like waves of scholarship. And I talked about the second wave of positive psychology. And then, I, you know, I think that's been now added to by a third wave of more like I call it like global psychology. And then there's another wave schema that's not about positive psychology, but just that wave be- about well-being scholarship generally. Like the first wave being psychiatry and psychotherapy like 200 years ago. The second wave being humanistic psychology about hundred years ago, the third wave of the well-being scholarship being scientific approaches to well-being from around 50 years ago onwards. And then in terms of well-being scholarship itself, the fourth wave being this more global wave of 
um, scholarship and interest, you know. So I think that's the kind of cutting edge of where we're at. And then that's what I'm trying to do with um, this global wellbeing initiative. But I could, couldn't help but think, you know, what's over the horizon? What could a fifth wave be? And then, you know, it occurred to me recently, I don't know if you've been taking an interest in this, but, I, you know, I'm so fascinated by the UAP phenomena and are we going to make contact with extraterrestrial life? And generally what, you know, where humanity is going in a sense. And I, you could think that maybe the fifth wave is going to be concern and engagement with non-human forms of intelligence. You know, so, I mean, extra or extraterrestrial life, that's one example, but there's AI, you know, and the convergence problem and how we, sorry, it's the alignment problem. And then how are we going to live sustainably alongside AI? And then also just all sentient life on earth. So, you know, I think where we're at now is taking a global perspective on well-being, but it's still like human focused. It's still human centric, mm. which is, you know, but that's kind of where we're at. But then over the horizon, we've got to think about how humankind exists alongside other life forms, whether that's, like I say, natural forms of life on Earth, AI, even ultra or extraterrestrials, you know, so I think that could be, and certainly in terms of AI, at least, you know, we really need to, not, need to start thinking about that. And what, what does it mean for an AI to have well-being or consciousness and then how do we coexist in terms of that and so it's just something i've been thinking about recently and maybe there's a potential for exploring that too but there's so much to do anyway in terms of exploring this more global perspective and i guess we'll just see where it goes you've got you've got a busy agenda ahead of you i can tell <laughs> yeah and plus i need to get back on the open mic scene i've not done music for too long and i've been meaning to would you like to give us a little sample right now Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> That's not fair, Scott. Direct, the guy's just, people <laughs> this guy's just got out of bed. Come on to be with us on the show. <laughs> it's, it's still got my croaky early morning voice. But if people are, my band is called Big Hand. We're on YouTube if you're interested in some. Oh, nice. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll put a link on the sh end of the show for you. Yeah. Uh -huh. that, was, that was another lifetime. But I, I, I do miss doing music to, just to kind of close up with that, you know. So I'd like to get back on the scene um, now that the kind of lockdown seems to be finally easing well it does create a unique emotional experience doesn't it you can't get that feeling many other places it certainly does it certainly does and you know i do miss those days of hmm. live performance and going to gigs and, and everything so it would be nice to at least have a, a taste of that again yeah well both mm -hmm. scott and i share that as well back in yeah. our earlier days so mm -hmm. know, nice. know exactly yeah. what you're feeling <laughs> yeah yeah well this has been really really rich and insightful and really appreciate your time thanks for coming on yeah tim thank you well you're welcome i hope that was useful to people i felt like i was rabbiting away oh, at points yeah. but Not it was all. a good conversation i really enjoyed it thank you guys no thank you all right folks thanks for listening and remember until next time the world is evolving are you